So the, the, the last speaker for today is going to be Veda. Veda is an uh, ESR of um, 5G Wireless. He's working at uh, TTI, uh, which is a small medium enterprise working on antennas uh, in Spain. And uh, he's also a PhD candidate uh, at the University of Santa. Okay, good, correct. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Sure. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Uh Good evening, everyone. So. This is going to be my uh, topic, uh, millimeter wave uh, multi-beam switching antenna. So, uh, this is the outline that I would uh, focus on. First, I'll introduce and then talk about the main challenges in millimeter wave beam forming. Of course, when I say this from the antenna design perspective. And then state of the art, I'll discuss on state of the art millimeter wave antennas. And then the millimeter wave antenna element design that I'm working on and then talk about the measurements that have been carried up using that design and then introduce how uh, I have incorporated that uh, element design into a multi-beam switching operation and share with you the analysis of that operation and then conclude and then give you some rest the, share with you the roadmap that I think I should I follow next and the future steps that I see from that. So first off, the current scenario uh, in millimeter wave communications. Uh, millimeter wave transmission has the capability of offering increased spectral efficiency. So this has been debated all over, and so the thing is, I, I cited from this paper here. And the current challenge is to overcome the unfavorable propagation by using high gain beamforming antennas. So you can use directional beamforming antennas uh, so that we can realize sufficient link margin by using, uh, when, you, when we use a large scale antenna array in this uh, scenario. So. Uh, the main challenges uh, when it comes to millimeter wave beam forming. So when it come, when we have common scatterers in the in the environment, the thing is the angles of arrival are not independent. So you can have surface or diffuse scattering which is common to different angles, and this can cause a problem in millimeter wave. This may also result in increased you know, inter-user interference. That's what I've written here. This one. So the, and then we have the core book and the non-core book beam forming. In the, the non-core book beam forming, you have low composite designs, perfect start, start, channel state information that is to be acquired. But this can be challenging because there are limited number of RF chains. The code, be code, be code book based beamforming has increased complexity overhead, but uh, it has a, over a complexity over to the search searching complexity that is, that is offered here. So there are two challenges. Then the other challenge is the lower rank of the channel matrix. Millimeter communications have strong line of sight component, as most of my colleagues here have discussed already. They work on line of sight component as, as well. So th that gives a lower rank of the channel, minimum channel matrix generally. So the special element of antennas need to be specifically adjusted so it increases the rank of channel matrix, which can be challenging at times. And then the shadowing. Uh, current assessment of the shadowing environment uh, and accounting for the attenuation loss by increasing the B forming gains uh, is, a, is, a, is a challenge by itself. So when you come to consider shadowing. Now, the talk, I've talked about the challenges in millimeter wave forming. I'll just give you a snapshot, I might say. There's a lot of information in here, but I put together all the antennas that are there, that are out there for millimeter wave antennas. So what I, uh, what I, what I want to do is I just take you through this very quickly. So this is a tilted beam combined antenna which is, gives you beam switching capability in the elevation angles. This is a turning torso antenna. It's, uh, it has a focused uh, beam over 360 degrees, over 16 beams. And this is a conformal array antenna. And that's the increased cross polar discrimination antenna with uh, parasitic uh, couplers on the on top of it. These geometries that you see here, this, this, and this are the printed antennas with uh, millimeter waves, uh, uh, millimeter wave, for millimeter wave, aired with substrate integrated wave wire, and this and this. And this is a differentially fed uh, antenna, which uh, gives this, and this is an inkjet, inkjet printed uh, millimeter wave antenna. So the thing about all of these antennas is that they all are designed to have one parameter in, in perspective, that is the gain. This, so I share with you this table uh, with very quickly. So you can see that the gains are high in these antennas, and they are using different polarizations in these antennas as a rough figure. And most of the and the impedance bandwidth is roughly around 20% for most of these antennas. And of course, this is this, this is just a digression from what I've written here because this is a microwave band, 
But I just write it because this technique could still be used in millimeter waves. So that's the reason why I shared it here. Uh, yeah, and as you can see, the frequency ranges are all in the millimeter wave range. Uh, okay, so this is the millimeter wave antenna element that uh, I've been working on. So it's a new high gain, uh, high directional antenna element. It has a gain of 7.5 dBi compared to the conventional uh, antenna gains. and uh, Bandwidth is from 13.5 to 15.5 gigahertz, and 13.8 percent impedance bandwidth, and size is from size is just a centimeter across, uh, a square centimeter across. So this is the written loss. Uh, so that this, uh, uh, this is minus 10 dB line that you see here, and the frequency is from 13.5 to 15.5, so it has a good bandwidth of 13.8 percent there, and the gain that you curve that you see here is for 7.5 dBi. And that's surface current distribution for the antenna. <coughs> so the surface current distribution for this particular antenna is shown there. This is the thing which has aided me to get back to this design and arrive at this solution. So you can, the, I, uh, you run a full wave 3D EM simulation, a full wave solution of the uh, electric fields, and then arrive at, uh, arrive at directions in which you have a high gain, and then you go work backwards starting from the goal of achieving a high gain and you attain this kind of uh, a geometry which would aid in achieving this performance. And that's the uh, simulated gain pattern of the antenna that you see in the end figure there. What's, what, what are the values on the x-axis for the gain pattern? Uh, the gain? This on one? The, yeah, it's 15 dBi. On the second, what is the range that you have? Uh, this is this, this cut 0 yeah. to 180 degrees. No, the y, the y, the y axis. Y axis. Y axis. Uh, this is still 10 dBi. Okay. And this is the 7.5 dBi gain that you see here for simulations. Okay. okay. I'm sorry, it's not it's not very clear. I'm just uh, because of the fonting, that's that. I'm sorry about that. Uh, if you can, uh, so the millimeter wave antenna element measurement uh, that, that was the element design, and this is the antenna element that has been fabricated and measured. Uh, it com consists of a PCB uh, structure, simple, low cost. Main main criteria was for this, and then. It can be printed and it has, uh, it has been assembled here and it's compared with the coin. So it's just the size of a coin, two millimeter, two, cent, two, cent, two, two euro coin. So, and this here is the comparison between the simulated and the measured written loss of this antenna element. And you can see there's a good agreement in the operational bandwidth. That's between 13.5 to 14.5 gigahertz. Uh, these are the antenna element pattern measurements, which have been compared with simulations and measurements. The red thing is the simulation, and the blue thing is the measurement. This is for the azimuth, and this is for the elevation. Both measure at one frequency of 14 gigahertz. Uh, although I don't show all of the patterns here, the pattern is uniform throughout the bandwidth. Uh, there is a slight discrepancy here. You can see this discrepancy in the measurement results. This is because of the supporting structure, which is not the same as was considered in the simulation, but if you account for this, when you make measurements, you have a supporting structure in the measurement. Because of that, you have this extra back lobes, but you can reduce the back lobes by having a supporting structure behind it in simulation. Oh, sorry. And that is the measured gain versus frequency. So that's 13.5 to 14.5. Uh, the gain measurement gives us a, as roughly a 6 dBi for a single antenna. That's the measured gain. Uh, yes, and then this is the uh, multi beam switching operation uh, that I will take you through. Now we have a single element antenna which has been designed, and we want to in incorporate this, which has roughly, as you can see, measured. I simulated it for 8 dBi, but I was able to get only 7 when I measured it. So I, I should use this single antenna with 7.5 or so dBi to get uh, a higher gain of, let's say, 18.5. That's what uh, Zahid was looking at the number, other one was 18.5 dBi in a small cell network. So that's roughly 20 dBi if you can get that using a, an array of networks. So you can have this kind of a structure of arrays and feed them with uh, excitations, which are different vectors of plus 1 and minus 1. Basically, it's the different phases of 0 to 1 and t altered through, you get a Borsard beam. That's the classical traditional Borsard beam for uniform excitation of uh, antenna arrays. And then, if you do the same with this kind of an excitation, 
you can generate a beam that's of that fashion, which which is which is multi-directional. Has each of these beam has a directional gain of 11.7 uh, dB, as you can see there. And uh, this has uh, uh, this has uh, this has a, uh, excitations in such a way that the currents allow the currents excited on this structure allow uh, the generation of such a kind of a pattern on uh, of the of the antenna pattern. And then I take you through a little bit more of these beam patterns. Uh, uh, the way that was that was horizontal. This is the elevation, and this is along all the four directions. You can say the four north, south, east, and west directions. If you put this in a small, small cell scenario case in a street urban scenario, that should that should be the antenna that one would I would I would go for. Uh, this way. So that's the thing, and uh, this is a bit to show that we can also do some slanting uh, for dual polarization, if you would will have some slanted beams. Uh, uh, of this structure, if you excite these antenna patterns with this kind of antenna excitation. Uh, I just put all of them together so you can have a look at the different directions that we can... Why I'm showing the... why I consider these different directions is when you have to put this into a small cell scenario, an urban street scenario, it's all about different directions and how you consider different things. So that's why I have different kinds of directions for these antennas. And this is all beam switching, all of this is beam switching, but if you consider this, this is beam steering. So for beam steering, I consider this as a linear array and did a progressive phase excitation. And the margin of which to I can excite, I can steer this was 30 degrees. So that means I can essentially steer this beam that is projecting outwards down and up by 30 degrees. That's, the, that's what that says, that the diagram there says. Uh, and then the beam steering was tested by at uh, uh, grating lobes, the spacing was just more than a 0.6 lambda. That was to avoid the grating lobes. Okay. Uh, the conclusion: uh, N5 antenna element has been designed with high directivity. Uh, it's a precursor to the design of millimeter wave subarrays or massive arrays, which may go into using this. This has been demonstrated by full wave simulations and fabrication and measurement results. Uh, it has a stable radiation pattern across the entire bandwidth of operation. Uh, and there is a novel beam switching scheme which allows us to cast multiple simultaneous high gain beams in different directions. Uh, okay, and then uh, just uh, my roadmap going further, what I would try to do is uh, collaborate with. Uh, uh, I'm currently work to integrate my antenna patterns into the channel models of Heritworth and Cerebral, and then the assessment of the performance of the altered and cellular network uh, can be started off considering a small cell scenario. And in the way forward, uh, what I think, from my perspective, is uh, we can have an antenna which goes, which combines all the things that are required by massive MIMO, millimeter wave, and single RF and generate in the convergence uh, an area which gives us a 5G uh, antenna array. <coughs> the work uh, is supported by 5G Wireless, yes, so it's the Horizon 2020 project. I'm grateful to that, and thank you so much. Uh, let's start with you. There are multiple generic comments, like the figure, I mean, I mean the axis weren't visible, so, okay. you know, I mean, I had to figure out, like, you know, ask you, sure. and uh, text was a bit dense. Um, the question I had in mind, the technical question was, uh, you talk about you can steer the beam, you can switch the beam by different excitations and sure. uh, things like that. Have you looked into like what is the typical switching time from one beam pattern to the other beam pattern? Yes. Um, yeah, that's the latency. That's that's the latency. Yeah. What is the, the latency? Lat what is the latency? Yes, actually, the latency is more of uh, the, the bottleneck, if I might say, the bottleneck of the latency is not the beam switching scheme that I would use, but rather the switches that would go into the operation of the antenna. Right. RF switches, for example, MEM switches. It goes to MEMS. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are MEM switches which can take, uh, which can operate at. Um, if you want to give me a give you a number, ten to ten milliseconds or less than that. Ten but that's that's ten where milliseconds. Ten milliseconds. Ten ten mils. Ten ten millis. Ten milliseconds. Yes, yes, something like that. So, but but the problem with that is, uh, when you switch things, 
I mean, if you want to realize this, uh, that's a very good question actually, but if you want to realize this, this particular antenna, then you would have to do it with, uh, uh, as without much of switches, because if you do that, you would have to, you will introduce much of latency into the beamforming network, essentially. Right. So that's the reason why you wouldn't want to go to do too many switching in networks. Actually, I didn't mention here, but I'm working now currently working on a feeding network, mm -hmm. which can feed these antennas in a way that it can reduce the latency. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have a question in terms of your. Antenna, you mentioned uh, what, kind, what type of antenna do you use for what type of antenna? What type of antenna? For your uh, 5G millimeter wave antenna element. Uh, this, this, you mean, you mean what? what, yeah, what? Uh, when you go back to the, yeah, yeah, the single, this one, which yeah. type is a dipole or patch or? Okay, this is, this, this has, I, I can explain to you the antenna structure. So this here is the is the launching point, the feeding point, and this here is the if you would want to go by the dipole analysis and analogy, this is the director element of the antenna. Okay. So and this would be the two-sided and directing beam, and then these are the parasitic patches which aid the transmission of a high gain element. So you can call this a kind of quasi quasi yagi or something. Yeah. When you uh, switch the beam, you you change the uh, face to feed the antenna system. Yes, yes. So uh, for your antenna array, how many elements do you have? Uh, it can it can vary. Actually, we are uh, for for the millimeter wave. Uh, I also work on the massive MIMO uh, antenna as well. So for the millimeter wave, we have decided on three cross three. That's nine elements for the beam switching scheme. But uh, you can this beam switching scheme is not dependent on the number of antenna elements. You can switch it. You can scale it to any number of antenna elements. But for the massive MIMO, we're looking at 64, something like eight cross eight. So you switch through the PD network system. Yes, but it's not. It's uh, that's exactly what this question. So I wouldn't be using a, a, a more number of switches, but would come up would, would have a technology which would uh, aid you the switching of the beams by minimizing the number of switches. For example, you minimize the number of RF chains in the same way you minimize the number of switches. So you use the switches for switching the beam or just to the that, the, the, yes, that's the, the thing about this is, this excitation does not require multiple states. It requires only two states. One is the zero degree and the 180 degree. Only two states. So it's more like you don't have to switch everything. You just have to take certain things because it's only two states. Either yes or no. You're 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 having you don't have to introduce anything, any values in between, any phase values which are in between these values. So the switching is a lot more simpler because it's just uh, two switch two switch switching so what kind of switch I have not gone into the switches yet because this is this is still in the antenna element part. Of course, in the in the future I would be. But if you ask me, I would I would actually go for something like MAMS if you would really get a hand on that, or or probably use. Uh, uh, any other technology that, that would be there in that time. Right? <laughs> 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 have, you, uh, have you measured the efficiency of these antenna elements? Yes, it is 89%. 89%, yes. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, just a continuation of both the last question. Uh, patient first versus uh, switchers. What is faster? It depends on the kind of phase shifter you use. Uh, you, can, you get many commercial phase shifters which are uh, I, I guess switches are fast. Switch, yeah. Yes. In general, switches yes, are fast. Yes, general switches are fast. Okay. Yes. And, and that was ten milliseconds. Yes, you can take that. Yes. Okay. Ten milliseconds. But don't quote me on that. Just check it back yourself. <laughs> uh, okay. No, I, I was actually yeah. have the same question to, to uh, Randy. Uh -huh. He said something like uh, ten nanoseconds. Uh, uh, oh, okay. Some, Maybe some, some, yeah, it's some available, available, but of course it could yeah, be yeah, modern. Uh, what it is, uh, sure. uh, but what is more interesting is when we have the separate beams. Yeah. So I guess you put a null in between. So in, in the design, you have nulls in between. Yes, these are the nulls. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, that's the, that, those are the nulls. You can see this, right? Yeah. So these are these are the nulls. These points yeah. are the nulls. 
But the beam switching scheme is not focused on generating the nulls. It's more focused on generating the pattern. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's say that we have only a simple scenario with two beams and uh, there is nulls in between. Yeah. And if you're switching or if you're sweeping, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, since they're using the same uh, space, mm -hmm. and I would presume they're at the same frequency, uh, when they, they actually sweep, is there no interference or how does it work? When, let's say a case like that. When they cross over, is there no interference? They're not crossing over, right? These are coming out of the... Um, so in a mobility can you, can you scenario? Read? So you can imagine there's two beams, uh -huh. one user connected here, one user uh -huh. connected here, yeah. and when they cross over, uh -huh. it's the same space uh -huh. and at the same frequency. Uh -huh. So is there some kind of, uh, uh, do I need time scheduling? Or oh yes, oh okay, okay. You mean the uh, interference issues? So can, yeah, can I have the two beams at the same time with mobility? And my two beam selection. That yeah, that's that beam selection actually. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, I cannot have both the beams. No, these are all at the same time. Now you're saying that if you have two users, for example, they are selecting two different beams. Mm -hmm. What if they cross over? And if your beam is following the user, there will be a case oh. where one beam is also connected. Uh, okay, also so for that case, you need what is called zero forcing beam for me. Yes. ZF, ZF beam for me. And it depends on the degree yes. of freedom you have in the, in the antenna. Yes, yeah. exactly. And the degrees of freedom of the antenna. So that limits yes. the number of users that you can serve yeah. at a certain yes. point. Yeah, so uh, technically, if we have two beams in two directions, they have a certain area in which they can function, but never cross over. No. Well, yeah, he, 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 it's like you explained with zero forcing. Yeah, zero forcing. You, you, you just when you have two beams which are crossing over each other, if you make a zero forcing scheme, or if you if you say so do a modulation, yeah, modulation to it, yes. which is directional, you will you will you will actually not have allow the users to interfere. That's that's what would happen. Okay, but also zero forcing is a digital technique. Yes. 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 I mean, this is not clear to me because uh, zero forcing is a digital pre-coding? Yes, no, no. I, I wouldn't be doing zero forcing here. It's, it doesn't this. I was saying how it would work. Mm. How it would work. Okay. So yes, in, yes. in this case, we cannot have uh, this scenario, like I said. So if there's two users connected, they're just connected like that. But if they have to cross over, we cannot do that. If, if the users cross over, you can still have it, but it's not related to the physical layer aspect. Yes. It would be something which is in the network layer where you can separate the users. But if you have to do it with interference in the physical layer, in that case, you have to project nulls. That's it. That's all, that's how, that's all how you can tackle the interference problem in the physical layer. Do you, that's, do you have RF chains for every antenna? No. Uh, I would I would I would I would love to minimize the RF chains in the network antennas. Do you have a feeding network? Uh, yes. Only one RF chain. One RF chain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Last okay. question. Uh, you, in the last slides, you mentioned about uh, having this massive MIMO millimeter wave combination. Uh, uh, as I understand, most likely massive MIMO will be used at lower frequencies, up 60 hertz, and millimeter waves at higher frequencies. How do you do? Do you have some plan for this? Well, actually, the the thing is, uh, I don't know if I can like, if I can talk about the frequency ranges, but uh, a massive MIMO has a sub six gigahertz range. Sub six gigahertz range it operates below that generally. So anything above six gigahertz and above that will be considered millimeter wave. So I mean, you would say I know you would say thirty probably yeah. thirty gigahertz, but there are there are papers which which work even at six gigahertz onwards as well. So that's that's from where that's how I come from saying. But even then, even the frequencies don't match. Uh, the antenna can sometimes be scalable. So you can use this antenna, which was a millimeter wave in the Massimo regime or in the single RF regime. That's what I would say. Yeah. You can send from its beam two different signals or one signal? You can send the si from this scenario, it is the same signal. Mm -hmm. Because so, it has one RF chain. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, okay. Yes, so the thing is, from this kind of beam, because there is one RF chain, you send the same signal. But this is 3 by 3. 
right? Yes. So you can have another three by three here, and a three by three here, and a three by three here, and send four four signals, but all having this kind of pattern of okay. these lines. Okay. They would, oh, and they would choose to do this on the nulls. On the nulls. Okay, okay, yes. Okay. And another very simple question. On slide 10, I think, when we have the bandwidth, yeah. I would just cure it because I haven't seen it. Uh, the bandwidth can you define it as a percentage? Is it a percentage of the higher frequency? Uh, the bandwidth uh, that you, when you define this as a percentage, is the ratio of the center frequency, mm -hmm. that is this frequency, uh, this frequency over the, the, the yes. difference between the okay, two frequencies. Okay. Okay, so when, when you do that, you get this 13 point. It's essentially derived from this. You get 13 yes, point yes. frequency. Yes, I don't know this convention. It's used, yeah, it's, both are used. <laughs> 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 okay, thanks. Comments, other comments? I will uh, just two minutes and then, then we'll leave. So it's, I mean, it's, it's very good. From the point of view of the presentation, you know, the figures are quite uh, small. It's difficult to read the legend. Or, I mean, it, it's something you understand now. It's not, uh, not going to repeat. So you asked a couple of questions that I wanted to ask you. One was the switches. So the kind of speed that you can get with the switches. So exactly what you are saying, Zaid, is it's correct. Because I, I was actually doing some research on that to see how much you can, you can switch. And there are indeed the switches that in theory can reach tens of nanoseconds. Uh, yes, by using yes. uh, pin diodes uh, or uh, fat uh, switches. They are not, MEMS are much slower mm -hmm. than, uh, than mm -hmm. pin diodes and, and fat. So the new technology should go towards this uh, tens of nanoseconds of switch. It seems to be possible. Then, I mean, I'm not sure ex in practice what you can achieve, uh, if they are adapted or whatever. I mean, that, that's not really clear. But it seems that they are, at least, I mean, I found some references because we are working on something similar, which is not what you were saying, that you have an antenna, another um, three elements, three elements, three elements, and you send multiple streams, but that you really encode the information on the different radiation patterns. And so some people were trying to understand how fast you can, you can switch on, on that. That's one thing. The other, the other question is the same as the, that you asked now, uh, at the very last, which is how you can, you can you make massive MIMO millimeter wave work together? So this is essentially what many people in the industry say that you really have to have two different technologies. So they, they really see very hard to do that. So that's something that I was about to ask okay. you. How you really okay. want to make these things? Because apparently the technologies that you use to implement the antenna seems to be quite, uh, quite different. Yeah. So that's a little bit the thing. That's, that's a little bit the thing. So for my... So from my point of view, is, uh, you, I, I have one question that people uh, started asking me now, uh, people working in, in, in the antenna design. So did you try to measure the correlation coefficients between the different radiation patterns? So how close the radiation patterns are, or how orthogonal they are? How different they are? Is there a way, I mean, to see how different they are? I have put the co correlation coefficients, no, but uh, mutual coupling, yes. Mutual, okay, but mutual coupling mutual is another coupling story. Is, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, correlation coefficients, uh, I've not measured the correlation coefficients of uh, how they do it, mm -hmm. but I guess mutual coupling would still give us the same idea as a correlation coefficient would give us. That's what I, my perspective is. Mm -hmm. But, I'm not, but I'm, not done, I'm not done that. Which values did you get, more or less? Machine coupling. This is this this is this is all considering machine coupling. Whatever values you see here, or are considering machine coupling. No, but I'm 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 asking this. Sorry, I I'm the isolation. Sorry, formulate the question. How close the radiation patterns are? Ah, uh, when you have this kind of uh, antenna array, the isolation would be 25 degrees less than uh, isolation between the elements. No, no, I'm saying, you know, you have like two, two radiation patterns. Uh -huh. If there is any way to see how different they are in the 3D domain. Ah, okay. The, that's what's that correlation. So some, some people working in antenna, so uh -huh. in order to see how good your radiation patterns are for uh -huh. some applications, they look at this correlation coefficient, which is completely integrated with the radiation patterns in the 3D, in the 3D, okay. the 3D dimensional things. I was wondering if you had any chance. No, I've not done that. I, I'll, I'll explore that. Yes, yes. I would, I would so take just that. Just my yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. Don't you need a channel to get that? <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you can measure so, that separately. So that's, the, that's exactly my point, and something that I wanted to ask you. That's okay. exactly my point, because I talked to the, to the antenna guys, 
and they essentially they design the radiation patterns and they measure these 3D, these 3D radiation patterns and they, they, they measure this 3D correlation. Uh -huh. But then when I'm me, who's trying to do the analysis, and I put this into the, the channel model that Ahmed showed, uh -huh. this with the race and with the cluster, you essentially see that you sample with your antenna radi with your radiation patterns, mm -hmm. the channels, mm -hmm. according to the different locations of the uh, rays and, and clusters. Yes. So from my point of view, yes, also the statistics of the channels uh, comes into play in order to see that. I believe it's not possible to separate both that, that specific uh, characteristic, but I'm not sure. I'm no, sure. Uh, th this is so I cannot answer in the sense that this is the question that I'm asking to the antenna guys and to the channel uh, modeling guys. And if you say this, I'm very glad that you say this. Because that's essentially my point. But on the other hand, they tend to differentiate these two things. We have the channel, and I'm not sure how you could compute such a thing. Uh, me, me too. But I'm talking only with antenna guys, yeah, yeah. and they don't even know what the channel. I mean, yeah, your kind of channels. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll have to see that. Yeah, that's I don't, I don't. Okay. So thank you very much, guys. I think that. Thank you. 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 Thank you.